So what, is the, you know, what does that mean about our current extension efforts? Currently, it's not quite moribund, but it's obviously well below the potential implied by the roughly 20% of the research funding that goes to universities and the unique expertise that's there. And again, Steve Powell and Chris Preston would illustrate this, that the straight, great strengths in Australia for looking at herbicide resistance management, especially at the mechanism level, is largely in universities. And uh, Jim Prattley's another example. We have to be, in a country as small as Australia is, with its relatively small research infrastructure, we have to be able to fully utilize the capabilities we have in universities to, to cover all the areas that need to be covered. The, the, the other issue then is that university staff, in principle, this is a great opportunity because university staff are especially aligned with teaching and establishing rapport with students, many of whom will be the next generation of agriculturists and agricultural leaders. It's a natural mechanism to develop a tie, a lifelong network that will continue for many years to come. I would argue this is an asset and an opportunity loss, and especially so with the decline of state activity. Turning then to look at what happens to the U.S. land grant system, there is a long history of, of connecting extension to teaching in the U.S., dating from 1862 with the Hatch Act. And indeed, the reason we call it the land grant system was that land grants of land were set aside for the establishment of public universities with a strong agricultural focus. That's where the name comes from. In 1914, the Smith Lever Act established the Cooperative Extension Service, which you may have heard of, but not realized that the name cooperative is specifically because it was intended to talk about the federal government and states and universities cooperating in all the transfer. Many academics in U.S. university systems have joint extension research and teaching appointments, um, even across, even including people from the USDA sometimes and state agencies. And it's very successful. Um, the relationships established often continue with students for decades, linking um, the, the teaching experience with eventual field adaptation. And people often maintain these relationships for 20 or 30 years, which puts university people in a particularly great position to influence adoption of the long term. People know them, the students go out, they become uh, leaders in the industry, they know the, um, the people they're working with, and they're able, they, they accept um, a close interaction with people and accept the kind of information that's being produced. And it and still retains this, this um, in, in inquiry-based approach to um, extension. One of the key issues for this, and this hit me as a light bulb one day when I was talking with John Karen, because we were talking about why it was there was declining capabilities, as was referred to earlier by Jim, the declining um, a range of universities in Australia that offer any agriculture, whereas in the United States, um, agriculture is still remarkably strong. When I was undergraduate at the University of California, Davis, taking entomology in, 19, in the 1970s, there were 50 to 75 undergraduates doing entomology. There are now just 15, but the entomology department has not shrunk by 70% because there's a strong base of support. And part of that comes from support from the USDA. There's about a billion dollars a year that comes from the USDA, mostly on a statutory formula basis that it also includes mandatory and public reporting to show the funds are being wisely used. The funds are typically used for the base operating support of individual departments or, or faculties and includes such things as travel, um, all those kinds of things that are critical to actually getting extension done. If we were to look at the billion dollars a year subsidy that comes from essentially the Department of Primary Industries to education um, and scale to Australia at one fifteenth the population size, we'd be talking about something on the order of $67 million going to Australian universities that are active in agriculture. Now, if you work out the numbers, depending on how you want to look at this, I figure that for um, faculty like mine, that would be something on the order of 2 to $5 million, which would erase my recurrent budget deficit and actually give me some freedom to be able to operate and be able to send people out on extension tours, a capability I don't have now. Typically, in most cases, there's also some state government support directly to universities because, after all, it's a cooperative extension service that involves all the players. Um, and that's how, to a large extent, U.S. universities have been able to um, largely, not completely, maintain their strengths in agriculture despite the fact that they also suffer the decline in student numbers that we see in Australia. In summary, Australian universities are probably underperforming considerably compared to the research grant success and the knowledge capital that they have. The U.S. land grant system, by comparison, is much more effective. There's a strong link into funding, research, and 
great direct contact with future land managers. From a, again, I'll, I'll take the same line that Mark did. Um, the, the future actions that I'm going to recommend here are a personal view and don't necessarily recommend represent the views of the Australian Council of Deans of Agriculture, the University of Melbourne, and anyone else. But it seems to me that it's inevitable we have to consider reinvesting in universities to help fill the gap of knowledge partnerships to allow public and the agricultural industries to fully reap the benefits of agricultural research investment by all the parties. But I think it would probably also be true that the majority of impact would be in the areas of public good that have been particularly of concern to the Productivity Commission in its recent reports. Just by the nature of the kinds of research that uh, get done in universities, such as pest management, looking to reduce pesticide use. And I think that we also ought to learn a lot from the U.S. model and not try to fund these things by grants. The, the, what, this has been a very successful program for over 100 years in the United States, at least in part because it wasn't tied up in high transaction costs in trying to dole out, which in the grand scheme of things is actually still a modest amount of money. And to, to follow the kind of model that has been adopted in the United States where you'd, for, you'd fund these things on a formula that was tied directly to, uh, and funded directly to agricultural faculties and schools, it was based on the number of um, academics on continuing appointments that were actually working in the area of agricultural focus. It could be negotiated between the, um, the, the Commonwealth government and the universities is exactly how this formula would work. But I think that there's a lot to be said that it should be based on a formula basis and not done in competitive grants in view of the fact that you're really looking at a long-term commitment of 10 or 20 years. Where should the money come from? Probably my most provocative suggestion, given the Productivity Commission has already been tinkering with the idea of withdrawing some of the public funds from research and development corporations. My argument is there's no better place, if you were to take a step like that, than to reinvest them in the universities. So they actually had a chance to um, achieve their proper status in contributing to the uh, extension needs of the country. Thank you very much.